I know that um, that you enjoy hearing Chris speak, and I do. I always get a lot out of, of every time he speaks, so I'm excited for him to come and speak to us today and kick this series off. So would you welcome our administrative pastor, Chris Whitman. Good morning. Um, I am very excited to uh, kick off the series. Um, Excited to see all of you here today. Um, I've missed Amy and Derek so much. And they brought the baby back on a day that I can't hold him, so that makes me mad. <laughs> um, I'll get over it. Um, but uh, yes, welcome all of you. I'm so excited about this series. Um, I believe it's something that God laid on my heart for uh, everyone that's here today. And uh, um, I really just believe lives are going to be changed. Um, I want to say thank you to the, uh, the set. It's beautiful. Uh, my dad did some hard work on that, and Lisa and Kristen, and um, the, the, the judges. See, you know uh, that looks really good. That's, that's some good work up there. They did well. Um, talking about uh, the title of this series called "The Verdict." Um, today's title is called "Counterfeit." Christian. Um, uh, lots of times uh, I believe that um, Satan may shout that in your ear, um, that you're a counterfeit Christian, that because of this you can't possibly be a real Christian because you struggle in this area. You can't possibly be a real Christian. Uh, I see so many people walk around with their heads down that way and feeling that way. Christian people that um, Jesus has gave his life so that you could have life. And we should be the ones walking around with our heads up high. But Satan is constantly trying to tear us back down again. Um, and he achieves that a lot of times where we um, maybe sit in a corner or we're just waiting for Jesus to come back because uh, we can't take life here anymore. And I don't believe that's the way that Christ intended for us to live. Uh, it's sure it's hard to lead someone to Christ when you walk around with your head down all the time. Uh, it's sure it's hard to offer someone what Christ has done for you when you look a lot sadder than they do. Amen? Uh, that's really hard. But today, the topic is uh, counterfeit Christian. And I'm going to talk about three areas that I believe that Satan really... Um, attacks us a lot. Uh, it's uh, three areas that I know that I personally struggle with, and I believe with everyone except Allie, uh, <laughs> uh, probably struggles with at least one or two of these areas. Sorry, I, don't know your word. I love you. Uh, but you know how you feel will determine your focus. Um, if you do feel beat up, if you do feel like the world's crashing down on you, if you feel like you have so much pressure, or if you're scared to take a step because of fear, and you don't know uh, what's out there on the other side, or your flesh and the desires of the flesh have you constantly going off in different directions, um, your focus is off of what Christ has for you. And, uh, and the life that he intends for you. So I want to talk about those three areas. Um, our main verse is uh, Zechariah 3.1. So I want you all to do your phones or flip your Bible. or um, For Kristen and Tony, you guys are just going to know all the scriptures. <laughs> so uh, you'll, know, you'll know about this one. Zechariah 3.1. Um, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. I want to stop there. Um, I want you to think about um, the most dedicated Christian, the most, uh, I don't want to say religious, but the most, you know, it's like the biggest Christian you know out there. I want you to think about that person. Um, for me, it's 
probably my grandmother. She was just like, um, she knows so much scripture and she, you know, it's all by the, by the book. And um, she's been through a lot in her life and I've just seen um, her overcome time and time again and live a life no matter what in love with Jesus. And she's just that person. Do you guys have those kind of people in your life? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to like think about Billy Graham because you don't really know him. Uh, you know of him, but I always want you to kind of think of those people. That's who Joshua is. You know, he, those people that you're putting up on this pedestal that you think is, you know, just the best Christian in the whole world. Um, Joshua's above that. He's the high priest. And here's Joshua. Um, the high priest uh, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan is at his right side accusing him. Standing at his right side to accuse him. Now, um, that's the high priest. That's the person that's way up here. And um, Satan's still at his right side uh, ready to accuse him. So, in saying that, I don't believe any of us are, we don't get a free pass on Satan um, accusing us of stuff. Because if he's going after the high priest, the one that, um, you know, God's put in place here, and the one that we look at and think is next to perfect, the best Christian out there, uh, I believe Satan's really going to, you know, accuse us and attack us too. Accuse us of uh, things that we may struggle with. And that's what I want to talk about today. I've got three that I want to talk about. I want to talk about depression. And I want to talk about fear. And then we're going to talk about lust. Because um, I believe these are three hard areas that uh, the devil really will tap you on your shoulder and go, you know, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't really struggle in this area. Um, talked to many of you uh, before, over time, and I'm not going to call any names out. You guys know who you are. Um, and, and most of you know that I went through a battle of depression um, that tore me down pretty good. Um, but I know that many of you struggle here, so... And... And I'm going to read some things that I know how you feel. But for those that maybe don't struggle with depression, uh, once you kind of get a grasp of a person that does struggle with depression, kind of how they feel and just where they're at in life, on a daily, ba on a daily basis. Because if you're really struggling with depression, and even though you may think you're not, uh, some of these things might hit home with you. And you might go, hey, you know, I really do. Now, you don't won't find the word depression in Scripture. Um, it's, not in, it's not anywhere in Scripture. But the Bible does use words such as downcast, discouraged, downhearted, mourning, troubled, uh, miserable, despairing, and brokenhearted. Um, the Bible does talk about those things, and that's depression. Those, those words describe the word we created for depression. Um, we just put it in one word. But uh, if you struggle with depression, um, you have a hard time finding any friends that you feel like you can count on. Um, oftentimes you feel like no one understands you. Like at all. Um, like Elena shared on her video this morning, you know, she felt like no one understood her. Um, you feel like you have no one to talk to. You put on a fake smile and you hide your hurt every day. I'm sorry I keep feeling, I feel like I'm turning my back to this over here, but everybody's on this side today. It's just kind of like, I'm not neglecting you. I love you. <laughs> Um, you don't want to talk to anyone, or um, you feel like crying a lot. 
Anybody in here ever feel like crying like all the time? Yeah, me too. Or I did. Well, some days I still do. You feel like you do nothing right. Like anything you do is just wrong. And you're never going to be appreciated for it. And just, you know, no matter how well you do it or what you think you're doing is going to be this most perfect thing. Uh, you just feel like you can't do it right. Uh, you're judged for all you do wrong. But you're really not. That's just how you feel. The things that you do wrong, you feel like you can't, there's no freedom from that. You want to hurt yourself. That's what uh, Elena shared in her video today. That she did several times that she felt like it was time. That she just couldn't rid herself of this depression and this life and, and how she felt about things. You overthink everything. Overthink everything. You worry yourself to death overthinking almost everything. If you're struggling with depression. You're tired all the time. Now, tired all the time goes with a lot of other things. So, I don't want you, because you work all the time and you're tired, to think that you're struggling with depression. That's not the case. But you just feel tired all the time. And if depression is impacting your life, you know what I'm talking about. There's no motivation. There's no, there's no want to. There's no life to... to to do, to get up and go out, to do anything. You feel empty. You want to give up. You walk around with a smile on your face all the time. You feel sad for no reason. You ever just woke up sad? Uh, this past week we were supposed to wake up and rejoice every morning as we woke up. How many of you did that? They're not good, they're not good uh, listeners. You're supposed to wake up and rejoice in the Lord. The, every day was the day that He made. And rejoice in what He did for you. That's what you were supposed to do last week. But it's hard to do that when you feel sad. and You wake up and you automatically feel sad for no reason. You don't know why. Or you have pain that hurts like hell and you don't know where it comes from. Depression is real. Depression takes lives. Depression Depression is something that Satan really uses to hold a Christian down. To hold anybody down. So now you're, you're depressed and you have all this pain and you feel this way. And I know many of you have related to a lot of the things that I just listed there. You, you may ask yourself that you're, you know, you, you feel different. And you're depressed about that, that I'm a different person. People don't understand me because I feel different. And... Uh, that's a hard thing to deal with. Uh, you find yourself not trusting people. But with all this going on in your life, if you're struggling with depression, where's your focus now? Are you focused on what Christ has for you? Are you focused on the life that He has for you? Are you focused on what He's focused on? Or do you now turn and focus on your pain? And focus on all these ways that you feel, all these things that you feel. I believe there's nothing worse than a Christian that is in depression and has this life that Christ wants to offer them and has already given them because they've already passed from death to life. They're already a new creation. But that devil wants to tap you on your shoulder and remind you of things. Wants you, to, wants you to believe that because you struggle in this area, there's no way you can really be Christian. You know, you walk into church every Sunday and you're just the fake as you can be. You're just 
just fake. That might, might be why some of you aren't here every Sunday. Maybe you only come a few Sundays. Because that depression and that and Satan tapping you on your shoulder Sunday mornings when you wake up to say, you have no place with those people. You don't fit there. Those people have a life. You don't. You have nothing. You struggle with depression. You struggle with all these things. And then he'll, he'll say, they don't want you there. He'll tell you that no one's going to want to talk to you. No one's going to want to be your friend. And most of all, you can't trust anybody there. It's scary to be in that place and feel that way. When I struggle with depression, I thank God that it didn't last a long time, but it lasted long enough. And I remember those. I remember feeling those ways. I remember not wanting to be around any of you. Um, matter of fact, I put myself in a place where I went to work and I wasn't ever here. Because um, I didn't want to be around you. Because these are the things that Satan was telling me. Telling me I'm a counterfeit Christian. What I want you to know is that it happens to everybody. It's more common than you think it is. Now, I know there's different levels of depression. But it happens to everybody. We can look at a story in the Bible of Elijah um, from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. I'll let you take this. Elijah came to a broom brush, which is basically a tree that goes, you know, and it has shade. Um, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. This happens right after he called fire down from heaven. Like in the chapter before, at the end of it, he had just called fire down from heaven. And burn up this big sacrifice thing that he built when he was in competition with the prophets of Baal. Not only did he call fire down from heaven and, bur and that burn up like that, but he soaked it with water and poured water all around it. I've never been able to get anything to burn that's soaking wet. <laughs> so he just did that. He slaughtered over 500 prophets afterwards. And then here we are early in the very next chapter And he's hiding under a broom bush asking God to take his life. <clears throat> In Matthew 14, 13, Jesus himself has just found out that John the Baptist has been beheaded in prison. And it says that he gets on um, a boat and withdrew himself privately to a solitary place. Even he felt some of the ways that you feel. He's been there. He's those things he's taken on himself, and he feels that way. Or he has. He he knows how you feel. He can relate to that. He felt that way about John the Baptist. I think in Elijah's case, as he was sleeping, the angel of the Lord came and gave him food and water. He said, wake up, your journey's long. And he ate, fell back to sleep. And he gave him more, came back and gave him more food and water. Your journey's long. Forty days that he had a journey, or is that right? I can't remember. They were preparing him for more, so it's like, you know, I need to use you. I don't need you under this broom brush. I need, I need to use you. I need you to be out here. Let me feed you. Let me bring you back to health, bring you back to what I created you for so that you can go out. And then Jesus, 
The very next scripture, after this one in Matthew 14, 13, says that the crowds began to draw near to him. And he saw the need that they had, and he had compassion and brought himself back to shore so that he could start ministering to them. It doesn't stop there. Matter of fact, the promise from Jesus in John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts as your comforter and your encourager. And Jesus has prayed for that. Jesus has prayed for you to have that in times that you feel depressed and that you start thinking these things. And Jesus also tells us in Matthew 28, 20 that He is going to be with us forever to the end of age. You have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit that's there for you. And trust me, I've struggled and been in that deep pit of depression and felt those ways before. And I know some of, some of you have it a lot worse than what I went through, and you've been dealing with it for many years. So I can't relate there. But I felt like the world was on top of me. And I wanted nothing more than for it just to end. <coughs> so I believe at some point that I can relate there to you, but I remember standing here and, and asking God, to fill me up again. I, I came in, at, a, at a place where it was, I couldn't minister to you. I shared, your, I shared with you my story. And then I turned around and just sought after God. Because I wanted Him to fill me back up again. And He did. So I believe that there's hope there because He says so. He says He's with you. He says there's a Holy Spirit there. And I know, it's, I know it's tough when you're in those places and Satan is always tapping you on the shoulder. But don't ever think that you're not what God has for you. Because all Christians at some point hurt like this. We all go through things in life that depression can sink in and, and kind of get a hold of us and grip us at times. But you're not counterfeit. You're just as much a Christian then as you were on the day that you gave your life to Christ. Because it doesn't change. He's still there for you. He's still your advocate and He sends another one, the Holy Spirit, to encourage and comfort you. The next one is... Uh, I want to talk about fear a little bit. The devil says it, you know, lots of times. And this one I can relate with a lot more, and I think many of us can, especially my leadership, because we've been <coughs> having leadership talks and in our meetings and stuff, and it's really good. Just so you know, from a leadership meeting is why that video was up there. <coughs> leaders ready to share their story. Leaders ready to stand out and let you hear who they were before Christ and the difference that he made. And leaders that are willing to stand up and say, because someone else loved me, I'm here. Thank you, man. Really thank you. But at a leadership class, that happens. But I find in our leadership classes that fear um, is very crippling to a lot of people. You know, When fear steps in, you don't want to take that step. You don't want to move. Uh, we have <laughs> somebody's in trouble. You see the fear in my eyes as they run out here. <laughs> um, fear. Fear is very crippling, and I believe that's one of the things that the devil goes. You know, if you the. Why you struggle with fear? You serve the all-powerful God. He has all the power, all the knowledge, all everything. 
Why are you struggling with fear? You can't be a real Christian if you struggle with fear. But fear does things like anxiety. Anybody ever feel that? Y'all don't want to participate today? <laughs> it's alright. Because by the end, eventually you all are going to raise your hands. Um, you know what anxiety will do to you inside. It will mess you. You know, you get sick at your stomach. You can't sleep. Um, not sure. Doubt. How many times do you doubt where you're at, what you're doing? That's fear. What God's called you to do, what God's called you to go, the direction. And you start doubting. <coughs> what about panic attacks? Anybody ever panic attacks? Yes, I want you to raise your hand if you have a panic attacks. You just hold that one down over there, but... <laughs> panic attacks. <laughs> I have. You'd be sleeping in the middle of the night and wake up from a panic attack. I don't even know where that comes from. I'm dreaming about roses and daisies. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm scared of flowers. <laughs> you become suspicious of everything. Yeah, that's when fear is really starting to get in there and creep in and really take over your life. You're suspicious of everything. You question God. You question motives of people that are closest and love, love you the most, that are around you. Then you begin to worry all the time. Worry is part of fear. Where's your focus when fear takes over? Are you still focused on God's promise and what God has said? And, what, and God's calling for your life and the direction He told you to go in? Are you still focused on that or are you focused on that fear and you know, on these things, the anxiety and the doubt? This is no lie. Um, last night, I fell asleep on the couch. And I don't remember what time it was, one in the morning maybe. He woke me up said, let's go to bed. About one in the morning, she wakes me up and says, let's go to bed. All right. Well, I've already been asleep since... 11. I think that's all the news. Uh, I go upstairs and I get in the bed and I lay down. And then Satan starts at 1 a.m. in the morning. He says, you know, that message that you have for tomorrow, that's crap. <laughs> it's crap. That's what he told me. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody in your church needs to hear that. What you're going to say is not going to make a bit of sense. Even more than that, nobody's even going to show up to hear. At one in the morning. This is what I'm being told. So now the fear, I have fear now. At one in the morning, I'm laying in the bed and I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death in my dream that the word that God's given me and the dream of this church and where we're supposed to go and the people we're supposed to minister to, I'm scared to death that it's all going to end today. At 1 o'clock in the morning. I start doubting God. I'm ate up with anxiety. I'm worrying to death that and Frank, I'm just to be honest with you. I'm worried to death of how I'm going to pay a bill today. For our church. But you know what? The devil's a liar. Because I see people sitting here today. Now the three that that called me and said I'm not going to be able to make it. And they probably that probably helped build up to the whole one o'clock in the morning episode. You know, because it's people that I really wanted to be here. 
and really wanted to hear this. So that probably built up to it. But I'm looking at a beautiful crowd of people. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I am. And I'm and I'm so the devil's a liar. Because there are people here. And maybe this message is making sense. I see the eyes of a lot of you and I believe that it's hitting somewhere. So I can tell you that the devil's a liar today. First John 4.18 says there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. That scripture right there makes me feel good a little bit. And then it makes me go, hmm. I don't know, it just does. And the rest of y'all get that? When that fear starts coming in, I believe we have to focus on his love for us. He gave us Jesus. He sacrificed His Son so that this doesn't have to happen to us. It may begin to happen, but there's scriptures that tells us the Holy Spirit's here for us, that Jesus is here for us, and that we don't have to get stuck in these places and, and be frozen with no movement because we're scared to death to take a step because we don't know what's going to happen next. I believe that Jesus is love. I believe his love will just shut fear up. And that's what happened to me at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm laying there in the bed. And it's like I hear Jesus say this to me. You know, I've been giving you like several scriptures that you have wrote down. That you've already read. That you're prepared to go tell everybody else tomorrow. I've already given you all these scriptures. Why are you laying in bed worried about this? So then I have to repeat these scriptures in my head. And you know what? I felt all better. And I went to sleep. And I ended up getting a few hours of sleep. But I believe that his, feet, his love will shut fear up. And I believe that his love will give us confidence. To take that next step and move forward. I have to hurry. If you're a real Christian, you wouldn't struggle with lust. I'm like on the edge here. Like, I don't even want to talk about lust. But it got on the paper. And here it is. I even, I even kind of sort of have a conversation with Kristen that, hey, I'm going to talk about lust on Sunday. And I need you to know that. <laughs> and she's like, well, what are you going to say? And I'm like, I can't tell you. <laughs> so here's where we are with this. Lust. I struggle with lust. And I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the in the world. Um, it's hard for men. And I don't want any of you to raise your hand or shake your heads. <laughs> I don't want anybody in trouble today. But what I want you to know is if I'm going to be real and stand up here and, and know that lust is such a big struggle among Everybody, I'll be the first one to take a step and say I struggle with lust. I go to the beach in the winter. Every winter we go to the beach. All the women got clothes on the beach. It's about a In the summer, we go to the mountains. 
Do we? We go on vacation in the summer, we go to the mountains. But it's still there. It's still, it's still everywhere. I mean, I can, I can, I can tell you what the sidewalks look like in downtown Greenville. <laughs> how pretty they are. I can tell you all about all the little messages on them everywhere. I can tell you how all the buildings look. Cause I have to walk around like this, or like this. <laughs> It's a real struggle. It is. But it's not just that. It's, you know, lust is so much more. Lust is food. Your appetite for food. Actually, what lust is, is feeding your flesh. Your flesh desires to feel good, and you feed it with things. That's not of God. That's what lust is. Lust is deeply rooted in your spiritual being also. As much as it is in your natural being. Your spiritual being, you desire to be loved by your Creator. Even if you don't know Christ. Because I've been there. You don't know Christ. You have a desire to be loved. Because you're made up of... But you're a spiritual being. At the same time you're a soul. At the same time you're a body. And all those have different needs. <coughs> your spiritual being desires to be have that connection with God. Like if you're struggling with any of this and it keeps you from God, you start sinking into that depression that I talked about. Because you want to feel, but you can't. Because something's in the way. In your spiritual life. And so I believe that your spiritual and your natural being both lust after the whole feeling good. But it's okay to lust after God. And feel good. And, and, and feel how it feels when He fills you up. When He makes you full of love and life. Those other things get you in trouble. Food will make you fat, and the other make you divorced. <laughs> Galatians 5.16 says, But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Flesh is all part of you. That's your soul. And it is hard. That's a daily constant battle. That flesh. But if you're walking by the Spirit, that advocate that Jesus prayed for you to, to have, that you have as a Christian, <coughs> you feel that up. You won't find a need to gratify that flesh. The words of Christ will be on your mind. The love of Christ will be behind all your actions. And the power of Christ will help you control your selfish desires. I have to be quick. Because it's after 11.30. And it's not my fault today. Because I told them I needed more time. <laughs> But I have a story I want to share with you. Uh, it's about yellow jackets. Uh, when I was young, I was on my way to the creek. And I was first in line. There was people behind me. And I go over uh, the bank there to start to go down to the creek. And I step right in the yellow jacket hole. Yeah, it was bad. I got stung 21 times. I ran so fast <laughs> from that place, which I don't know what, maybe 400 yards? 400 yards. I ran 400 yards in 4.3 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. 
I shout, I shouted bees and took off running so fast, and I still got stung 21 times. Last, last month, early last month, we discovered that I had this toolbox that I used to keep on my truck. And I don't have a truck no more, so I took the toolbox off with the tools and set it under my deck. One of the buttons broke on the end of it, so the yellow jackets went in and made a, uh, a nest, a hive. And Kristen can attest to this, this is not a preacher life. But the hive was literally like this big around. Uh, let me do it this way, so y'all can see. Like this big around. And probably about that thick. Are you selling the honey? No. <laughs> now I didn't know the size of this hive or how many yellow jackets were inside, but we could always see them swarming. It was under my deck. My dog would eat, my dog started peeing on the deck and doing his other business because every time he tried to go down the stairs, they'd get him. <laughs> so one day I went out there and said, I gotta move this because it's causing me trouble. So I grabbed the toolbox. And I started dragging it from the end that they weren't in. And I drug it out to the middle of the yard. And it scared me to death. I won't tell my kids that or my wife because they think I'm their hero. <laughs> but um, it did. It scared me. Because I've been stung by a lot of yellow jackets before. And how bad it hurts. I left it there for a few days and I soaked the washcloth and some gasoline and laid it over the hole thinking and maybe that'll kill them. Maybe that'll take care of them. I stuck a thing in the hole with the washcloth and gas on it, stuck it in the hole. They found other ways up in there. So I woke up one morning and I, Saturday morning, pretty early. I said, you know what? I gotta face this. Because it's a nuisance. It's something that's in my life that is scaring me, scaring my wife, scaring my kids, scaring my poor neighbor worse than any of us. <laughs> I said, I'm gonna have to go out here and I'm gonna have to get rid of them. Rid of them. I'm gonna have to take care of them. I was so scared to open up because I had to take a screwdriver to pop the lid up because the button's on. That's how they got in. So I had to get close. So I got close and I popped that lid open and it flew open and I took off running. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't see anything. I thought, oh, I know how many of these are in there because I see them flying and swarming all the time. So I ease my way back over and I look down and I see that hive. I don't see any bees. So I take a pitchfork and I stick it down in there and I pick the hive up and I lay it down. And I look down and thousands of bees are just in the bottom of my toolbox. And there's no life. Them. They're not swarming, they're not buzzing, it's kind of crawling over each other. Most of them are dead. Thousands of bees. And I just think, all I could think was thank you, God. It's not as bad as what I thought it was going to be. But with that story, what I want you to know is I had to confront that. If depression is part of your life, if fear is keeping you frozen in time, and if you're wasting all your time gratifying your flesh, you have no time to be what God wants you to be. Too much stuff's in your way. There's too many people out there that need Jesus that don't have it. And these three things have got you on lockdown. 
if you struggle with all three together, I'm so sorry. Because I know how tough it is. One can stop your life. All three together, is, you must feel like you have the whole world on your shoulders. I shared scripture with you today. It's so funny that I was so frightened of that toolbox and to open it up. The fear of what might happen. The thought of what happened before. But I find it funny that Satan, you know Satan knows your name? You all know that? Yes. He does. Satan knows your name. Does he ever call you by your name? Satan calls you by your sin. Satan calls you by your depression, your fear, and your struggles with lust. Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows your sin, your depression, your fear, your lust. He knows all those things and He calls you by your name, not your sin. That's good news. We serve a God that is so good to us and loves us so much that provided a way to Him through Jesus. He never intends for us to sit frozen in time because of fear or broken hearted because of depression gratifying our flesh. Back to Zechariah 3 and verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord will rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke Is this is not this a man a burning stick, a burning stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I've taken away your sin, and I've put fine garments on you. Struggles are real. But Jesus has now clothed you in something beautiful. The verdict is today you're beautiful in God's eyes. He doesn't see the filth in you. He sees you through what? Jesus sees you. He sees you through the cross because He made a way. What I want more than anything today. The most important thing is that everybody in the room knows Jesus. Seriously, I don't care where you're at. We're small, so as I start calling things out, I don't mean it intentionally. I just mean it to point, make a point. But if you're standing behind the camera today and you need Jesus, it doesn't matter where you're at. If you're on our staff, our leadership, our board, You've been living a lie, but you're so afraid to take that step forward because fear has got you locked down. None of us care. We want you to know Jesus. Jesus desires you. He loves you. No matter where you're at today, if you need Jesus, I'd right, ask you to come to the front. I know how hard that can be sometimes. The team's gonna play. Song? Still. What? I still believe. I still believe. I have some people in the back if you'd like for them to pray for you. Mm -hmm. The most important thing today is that everyone knows Jesus. He's calling you. That's the reason you're here at 15 minutes to 12. Because He wants you. No matter where you're at today. He desires you. He loves you so much. Also, if you're struggling with any of these areas, depression, fear, 
here's the kicker. Lust, fear, depression. You all raised your hand at some point in time. So I know you all need prayer. There's people in the back to pray for you. You can pray with each other. I just want you to take the time as we go through this song again. If you choose to give your life to Christ today, you have it. I would love to know. Because I'd love to celebrate with you. I pray right now that the Spirit just comes in and moves. And that your life is filled up with the Holy Spirit, with the love of God. Your blood makes the deaf to hear. Right now, your blood takes away the curse. Right now. 